All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar that's called It's Always the Nutritionist's Fault, Understanding Diets and Improving Communication on Your Dairy. My name is Margaret Quasdorf, and I'm the Northwest New York Regional Dairy Specialist. I've been with the Northwest New York uh, Regional Team for about two years now. Prior to that, I was managing a teaching dairy out in Iowa, and I worked as a nutritionist for a few years in South Central Wisconsin. Um, I really enjoy working with producers and their consultants to accomplish uh, their overall farm goals. And um, it just really makes me happy to be giving this talk this evening. Um, it's right up my alley and I, I think we're gonna learn a lot together. Um, I think, let's see here. I just gave uh, my introduction and um, I have two colleagues here that helped me. Um, we worked together to put this presentation together and Casey, do you wanna give a little bit of background? Sure, thanks Margaret. My name is Casey Havakis. I am one of the dairy specialists on the North Country Regional Ag Team. I've been in this role for just over a year now and prior to starting in this job, I was finishing up my grad studies at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario. Um, and there I was studying transition cow nutrition and feeding behavior. And prior to my time at Guelph, I started getting interested in nutrition through a summer internship that I had with Scott Thorne Nutrition out in Nova Scotia. So I'm excited to share with you some of what I learned from the client nutritionist relationship perspective later in the webinar. Um, Betsy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Casey. Um, I am Betsy Hicks. I am the dairy specialist for the South Central New York Dairy and Field Crops Program. Um, I've been with Extension for about six and a half years. And prior to my coming to Extension, I did nutritional consulting uh, in Central New York. So I loved my time doing what I did, um, but I'm really happy to be with Extension so I can share the best practices that I use to really form great relationships with my clients um, and bring perspective as a farmer and bring perspective as a nutritionist together. So we're excited to bring you this uh, presentation. It's a little tongue in cheek, right? Everybody knows um, it's always a nutritionist's fault, right? Nutritionists have broad shoulders. So a um, little tongue in cheek, but we're hoping that we can uh, bring up some topics that can bring everybody closer together. So. So to get started, uh, when Casey, Margaret, and I came together about this topic, the first and foremost thing we wanted to talk about for a goal was to improve communication between the farm and the nutritionist. Um, the second thing was to ensure that the dairy and the nutritionist have matching goals for the diet and for the farm. And a big part of this is for the farm or the farm client to understand what is actually in their diet and why it's being fed. Um, those three things are really the, the crux of what we're trying to get at tonight. Um, we do also want the farm to understand how to compare diets, whether this be from a forage change or when they're comparing diets between nutritionists. We do want the farm to also be able to clearly communicate issues on the farm to their nutritionists when they may arise. And then we hope the nutritionists can help use this guideline for conversations with farmers going forward. So those are the goals for today's webinar. And I think the first thing we're going to do is, uh, oh, Margaret's prompting me, make sure everybody feels free to plop your questions in on the Q&A box. Um, Casey, Margaret, and I will be monitoring that, and we're, we're happy to stop when we get a chance to, to answer those. So first up, uh, we've got a few polls throughout the evening. So the first thing we're going to do is our first poll. And so if you are a farmer, how would you describe your relationship with your nutritionist? And then if you're a nutritionist, for number two, uh, how would you describe your relationship with your client? So the beginning one is very poor, what nutritionists I never he hear or see from them, all the way to great, they are on speed dial and we communicate frequently. So if you're a nutritionist, answer number two. If you're a farmer, answer in number one. So we'll leave this poll open for a little bit. Um, feel free to enter your 
uh, response in. We this morning or this uh, earlier this afternoon, we had a great presentation and lots of interaction and lots of discussion. So feel free to plop anything into your poll that you may feel. I hope people are at their computers and can actually choose a poll or I hope that it is working because I'm not seeing anything coming in. I'm, oh good, we've got some responses coming in. Would you give just a little bit longer? So, okay, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So for the farmers, um, this is awesome. This is actually a little bit better than what we saw earlier today. Um, we see that on the end of the spectrum, that's on the good end. Um, we're pretty, pretty darn good. They check in and communicate frequently. And the same for nutritionists. We're in constant communication. That's awesome. Thank you so much for participating in that first poll. Um, we're going to keep moving on. So, so for the presentation, my section is understanding diets. And so this will be rather basic for the nutritionists on the call, but we felt it was important um, to step back and go over the basics of a diet summary for the farmers that are on the call. And, you know, we all probably took a nutrition class at some point in our careers or listened to nutritionists talk or what have you. And taking a step back to, to focus on those basics really helps frame what we're talking about. So parts of a diet summary is what we'll start with. And so first we want to describe the cow or the group of cows that this diet is being formulated for. We want to know the breed, the weight, body condition score, days in milk, milk production, milk uh, component production. Also on this diet summary, we should have the as fed and dry matter weights for forages and grains. We should have a section with nutrient parameters for the diet. Um, hopefully the additives are listed somewhere on that diet as well as the cost per head per day for the diet and additives. Um, looking a little deeper at nutrient parameters, um, some major ones that we're going to look at um, as a farmer when we're looking to try and compare diets. We want to know the total dry matter of the diet itself, um, the percent forage in the diet that the nutritionist is aiming for, um, crude protein, right or wrong, everybody looks at crude protein percent, but we also want to look at rumen degradable protein in the diet. And then our big carbohydrate numbers, sugar, starch, and digestible fiber. We also want to know fat and then our mineral and vitamin levels. Additives I have over there on the right hand side, and Margaret will be covering those uh, in a little bit, um, but basics, we should know the amount fed per head per day of e each additive that's in the diet and then the dollars per head per day cost. So uh, this is a one-page summary from CNCPS. Um, your nutritionist likely uses something different, and so a diet summary is going to look different from whatever nutrition company you're using. But the biggest things that we should look at across the top or somewhere within this diet summary, we should have that description of the cow. So this uh, diet is for pen one, and this pen of cows has an average body weight of 1,550 pounds and a body condition score of three. Um, this group is also averaging 80 days in milk and 85 pounds of milk per day with a 3, 8, and 3, 1 milk fat and milk protein. The software predicted their dry matter intake to be between 53 and 57 pounds per day. And we've formulated this diet for 54 pounds. So that's describing the cow or the herd of cows in that this diet is being fed for. The next thing we're going to look at, um, for you, for somebody looking at a diet that doesn't really know what they're looking at, you can look at these nutrient balances. So on a macro level, we have ME and MP, metabolizable energy, energy and metabolizable protein. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, next, we have the diet concentrations, um, which give the exact nutrient spec for that diet. And then over on the right, we've got the ration fed, which gives the ingredients in the diet, both forages and grains that are being fed. So we're going to look at these in a little bit more depth. 
So nutrient balances, like I said, when you're looking at a macro level, we've got metabolizable energy and metabolizable protein. This diet, the ME is over 100% of requirements. So ME is at 107 and the metabolizable protein is at 100. So when we look at the bottom green box, we see ME milk is actually over 93 pounds. Um, remember this diet, we describe the cow as being 85 pounds. Uh, production. So that's where we get the 107% of requirements. Um, and then our MP is right at our described 85 pounds. So already we see there's a little bit of um, difference here in this diet between ME and MP. Looking next at the diet concentrations, like I said, this, this list is uh, not exhaustive, but there's a lot of nutrients on here. And some are more important than others. And to a nutritionist, definitely some are more important than others. But the big ones we can look at are the diet dry matter, and this diet's 48, and then the forage percent in the diet, which is 57 and a half. Next are the protein numbers, crude protein at 15.6, and our degradable protein at 9.5. And then our sugar and starch at 3.8 and 28.8. So now if we look back at our nutrient balances, we knew our ME was a little bit high. The starch number at 28.8 is probably a little bit high too. So it starts to clue you in where these things are coming from. And then other numbers, uh, ether extract or fat, that's at 5.4. And I think I have one other thing in there. Ah, that was it. Okay. So, yep, keep going. So... The big thing when we're looking at nutrient parameters, as a producer, it is not necessarily important. It, no, it's not important for the producer to know how to formulate the diet. You are not the nutritionist. You don't need to know how to formulate. However, it is important to understand how the main nutrients change when there's a diet change or when you're trying to compare two diets side by side for price or performance. So in lactating diets, um, we should often keep our diet changes, uh, we should keep certain nutrients static through a diet change if possible. Um, some nutritionists will keep starch the same. If we go from one corn silage bunk uh, that tested really high in starch to one that tested really low, they'll move cornmeal up or down to match what needs to happen with the starch number. Other nutritionists will look at adding numbers together like sugar, starch, and digestible fiber, keeping the addition of those three numbers the same when they make a diet change. You should know and talk to your nutritionist to find out what their uh, frame of reference is when they're doing a diet change. Other nutrients like fat percent and room degradable protein, those numbers should probably stay pretty static through a diet change if possible. So looking now, um, at the ration fed, so the ingredients that we're feeding. So we have ingredient, this is on the right-hand side of the diet summary, the, the, the ingredient of what is being included, and that has four columns, uh, the dollars per head per day, so what does it cost in the diet, the percent dry matter of that ingredient, and then the pounds it's being fed as fed and dry matter. So for instance, if we look at uh, corn distillers grains there at the bottom, it's in this diet uh, at point, I'm sorry, at 30 cents per head per day. And uh, the percent dry matter of this feed is about 89. And it's being fed at three pounds of dry matter per day, and uh, which is as fed $3 or 3.38 pounds per day. Go ahead and click through, Margaret. Another one. There we go. One more. Perfect. So when we look at the bottom of our diet summary, we should see this at the bottom, which is the total cost, that $4.59. If that was the total cost for a lactating diet, that'd be pretty inexpensive. So we need to make sure, does this cost include the price of forages or homegrown forages? Likely this diet does not. Um, so we need to, when we're comparing diets, make sure that we know whether the cost is just purchased grains or if it includes forages as well. Um, also included that diet dry matter, which we saw in the nutrient parameters. And then um, we also see the dry matter intake that we're aiming for and the as fed intake that should be mixed. So um, with the diet dry matter intake, does this match actual dry matter intake on farm? And does the forage dry matter match the formulated diet dry matter? So we wanna make sure all these things match what is on paper as to what is going on on the farm. If they don't, that's an opportunity for um, 
an increase in performance, whether it's production or cost savings, it, it is definitely an opportunity. So um, the big thing uh, that we need to understand, some companies or some nutritionists may not tell you the exact formulation of your grain mix. It happens, sometimes that's just the way that a company is. However, they should be able to give you the diet summary, what the nutrient parameters are, and tell you which additives are in the diet and the main diet nutrient numbers. You should be able to get those things. So that brings up poll question two. So the poll question is, have you seen your diets? So I'm gonna launch the poll here. And so our answers are no. Um, yes, when I first started working with my nutritionist, but not recently. Um, and nutritionists, you can respond to this as you work with your clients. So, you know, if you share your uh, diets regularly with your clients, um, whenever you make a change, answer it that way. Um, if you make changes and then just talk about it, answer it that way. So we'll give a few more, a little bit now for everybody to answer, if we could. Getting some more responses. Thank you so much for doing the polls. It makes it more interesting for us behind this computer too. A few more seconds. All right, so this is great that um, if most people said yes, we're, we have seen our diets and we're familiar with the diet and uh, one person said, yep, we go over it regularly and have the same goals for the diet. Be nice if I share the results, there we go. So that's the end of poll question two. And I think now Margaret is gonna take over and talk a little bit about additives. Okay, so um, what is a feed additive? A feed additive is an ingredient that's added to your ration that has um, a function to either correct a ration imbalance. Um, it might help mitigate underperforming management and um, it also might magnify a productive response. A feed additive, additive should also achieve a return on investment, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Betsy, could you pull up poll question three? Which type of feed additives are in your rations? Both producers and nutritionists can answer this question. So there's a number of different types of feed additives and we have quite a few listed here. So just go through and check off which ones you know are in your rations, whether it's buffers, different yeast cultures, menensin, um, known better as rumensin, different mycotoxin binders, probiotics, bypass fat, organic minerals and trace minerals, um, omnigen, feed bunk stabilizers, Got a few people going through the list here. A few more seconds. Okay. Um, share, oops, share results. I think we can, great. Okay, so we see that a lot of people have a variety of different uh, feed additives in their ration. And like we're gonna talk about some of these feed additives um, have multiple effects, but, um, some just work in one area and we'll talk about that further. All right, the roles of different feed additives are uh, multiple. We can have feed additives that focus on energy balance and these are gonna be your propylene glycol, um, your rumen protected choline, bypass fats, probiotics, and menensin. Um, some feed additives work in more of the calcium balance area. So those are typically your DCAD balancers and all your different minerals that help balance the DCAD, calcium chloride, mag sulfate, cal sulfate, ammonium chloride. Um, different feed additives work in function. Uh, vitamin E, organic selenium, a lot of your yeast and moss products, as well as some organic trace minerals and your probiotics can play a role in immune function. Some work in rumen enhancement, so these are your direct fed microbials, yeast and yeast cultures, menensin, buffers, enzymes are added to this, probiotics, and some sugars. 
uh, reproductive efficiency usually comes through some of our bypass fats, organic selenium and beta carotene is a new, uh, there's some research out there that points to repro efficiency. Um, foot health, our big one is biotin that um, helps with the integrity of the hoof and the foot. Um, and then um, organic and inorganic trace minerals. Protein efficiency typically has quite a few different uh, feed additives. Most of them are amino acids or amino acid enhancers and also urea. And talk about mycotoxin inhibitors, um, which may include clay binders, different absorbents, and sometimes yeast and moss products. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list, and especially looking at this slide, this is just an example. Um, we're in no way trying to make claims about or promote any specific products, and it's not an exhaustive list. Um, if there are nutritionists or dairy producers out there who want to throw in the chat box other, um, other examples or other things, just throw them in there as comments or questions, and we'll get around to them. In this slide, um, you can follow the arrows, but these are just pointing to some of the different roles and the typical names that you might see in your diet. Um, again, some of these things might not be present in every uh, diet that you look at, especially if your nutritionist also formulates a protein, grain, or mineral mix. Um, some of these things might be in there and they may not um, always share that with you, but you can always ask what types of additives are in your diet so that you can further talk about it. Um, as you can see, um, there's, there can be several different um, additives that may contribute in a slightly different way, um, but may also play the same role. So um, this is why it's important to, you don't have to be the nutritionist, but um, it's important to understand that there's a number of different feed additives and um, just to be able to open up and talk about them. So how do we decide which feed additives are worth incorporating? I'm gonna walk through the 4R concept, which comes from Professor Emeritus Mike Hutchins out of the University of Illinois. And the first R that Mike says is response. So what are you, what are you looking for? What are you hoping to get out of this feed additive by incorporating it into your diet? Are you trying to target an increase in dry matter intake? Are you looking for um, success in your fresh cows? Are you looking to increase milk production or see an increase or response in components? Or are you looking for better, better growth rates in your heifers? Um, these are all um, things that you might consider when you're choosing a, a feed additive or a few to add to the diet. So I'm gonna have Betsy pull up poll question number four um, to kind of prompt us with our next R, but does, do you know your return on investment for any of the feed additives in your diet? And this goes for producers and nutritionists alike. So yes, I know return on investment. Um, with some work, I could come up with them. No, or return on investment doesn't matter to me. We've got some people voting here. We appreciate your votes. All right, Betsy, you can send us our results. Great, so we see that there's, there's a variety here. Some people um, are informed and, and know about the return on investment. Some people could probably figure it out. And there are a few that say that they don't know, but that's okay because we are gonna go through some of the ROIs and how to figure some out. All right, so just like I said, the second R is return. So we are looking for feed additives that have clear results and the best ratios. Um, we're also gonna consider um, we're gonna consider some of the benefits that don't necessarily have a monetary value. So sometimes it's hard to track um, cow health or overall better cow comfort. Um, and those are some things that you need to talk with your nutritionist about and notice on your farm. But we're gonna go through right now um, how to calculate a return on investment um, for a feed additive that costs three cents per head per day. 
So if milk is valued at 17 cents per pound, so that would be $17 per 100 weight, every cow must produce about 0.2 pounds more milk to cover that added cost associated with the additive. At $21 milk, um, the cows need to produce a bit less, only 0.1 pound per head per day um, to cover the cost and break even. I have the math written out there so that you can see how that was done. Of course, the more an additive costs, the higher the milk response needed from each cow to pay for it. An additive that costs 30 cents per head per day would need to prompt about 1.8 pounds more milk and 1.4 pounds more milk at 17 and $21 milk. So what if only one group responds, even though you've fed it to several groups or seven or, or to the whole herd? Um, you just have to remember that those cows must cover the additive cost for all cows that you're feeding the additive to. And a good rule of thumb is that an additive should return two or more dollars for each dollar invested to cover those non-responsive cows. Here are five fairly uh, typical benefit to cost ratios and their associated additives. So your anionic salts and those products typically found in your DCAD diets to prevent uh, milk fever, those have a 10 to one benefit to cost ratio. So typically those are gonna cost 40 to 75 cents per cow per day, and those are fed only to dry cows during the dry period. Um, you work with your nutritionist to set up your far off and close up dry groups or a one group TMR, but um, those are the typical ranges. Again, nutritionists, if you have other ideas or see other things and wanna throw it in the chat box or in the question section, please do so. Um, again, the next one, biotin. Five to one benefit to cost ratio. And biotin again is, is for hoof integrity. And that's gonna cost eight to 10 cents per cow per day and usually fed to the entire herd. The next one has a two to one benefit to cost ratio and that's your rumen protected choline, typically fed during the transition period to minimize fatty liver. And that's gonna run about 30 cents per cow per day. So you have to make sure that's one that you wanna check and make sure is, is working well. And then the next one is menensin, more commonly referred to by its trade name. Rumensin has a five to one ratio, uh, benefit to cost ratio, and that improves feed efficiency and shifts the rumen microbial population. And that one is, is fairly low cost at three cents per cow per day, and you typically leave that in the diet um, for all your cows around. The next one is yeast culture and yeast and has a four to one benefit to cost ratio. Yeasts are used for a lot of different things, but um, the most researched yeasts uh, stimulate fiber digesting bacteria and help stabilize the rumen, which can also lead to some different immune uh, function and good immune properties as well. And yeast typically run four to six cents per cow per day. And, and you can keep that in the herd year round or make it more targeted to your transition cows or where wherever you and your nutritionist decide to put it. So the third R in our four R concept is research. And with research, we wanna see a, a true impact and unbiased results. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of studies out there or, or different companies claiming that they have studies, but you really wanna look for a peer reviewed article um, where the product has been tested and, and reviewed and published in a peer-reviewed journal to make sure that the results are true um, to the best of our knowledge. This is really important because you wanna make sure that you do get your money's worth uh, with a product that you're purchasing and adding into a diet. And the fourth R is results from records on your farm. So this is, I, I stress, on your farm. Um, you're not worried about what your neighbor's doing or what Wisconsin is doing if you live in New York. You wanna look and see on your farm from your records, how, has, how have your animals responded to um, some of the feed additives that you've incorporated in your ration? And again, you're working with your nutritionist to help keep track of this and they'll help you um, understand where each of the additives might work 
and the effects to look for in your herd. Um, you might also work with your vet if you're looking for increased um, pregnancies or preg rates, or you're watching and monitoring fresh cow performance or production and components or overall cow health. These are all things that you can measure and monitor, uh, especially if you're making a diet change um, to see what the cows were doing before and what they're gonna be doing after you make this diet change. And then I'd like to just fit in one more R. Um, it's my own R. I say that right timing is important when you're deciding which additives are worth incorporating. And um, the traditional saying is time is money, but I would like to say that timing is money. And what I mean by this is that not every additive is going to be appropriate um, at the same uh, or at all times or to all different groups of animals. You want to make sure that it's relevant to the situation that you're in. And here in New York, just now we've finished or we're in getting towards the end of harvesting our corn silage crop. And on the picture on the right, you can see a beautifully defaced corn silage bunker from 2019. This corn as of September, and if it's not gone now into October, is the most fermented it's going to be throughout the year. And um, that means that the starch is the most available uh, right now versus when it was first chopped and packed in the bunk and before it was fully fermented. The picture on the left is of course of corn standing in the field. And so any um, ration or diet additive that is put into the diet to help enhance um, starch availability in the ration, uh, there are some different enzymes like that. Um, you might want to reserve those for times um, like now. If you run out of your corn silage and you're starting to feed fresh, hopefully you had enough carryover, but if you had to feed fresh, that might be something to incorporate, but it might be something to leave out when, um, when you're approaching chopping season again. Again, um, is it relevant? Are you the type of producer, do you work on a farm or with a farm that has a picture like the one that's now on the left? Or does their corn silage bunk look more like the one on the right in their grain bin um, look, or the grain coming out of their bin look like the picture on the top right? Um, there's a lot of different things that we can do um, management wise that can help us save money and can also help us decide which additives are worth incorporating. Um, we're going to talk with Casey next on management of, of our, our management on the farm to decide whether or not we're going to be able to have these additives or not. So Casey? Yeah, before I get started, Margaret, it looks like you have a question here um, in the Q&A box. Do you want to Adjust that before we move on to this section while we're still in ours. Um, sure. So, Kim said, when looking at return on investment, it's important to look at all benefits, not just milk yield. For example, feed efficiency, health benefits. Yes, definitely. So, yep, I did. I did just go through an example about calculating it um, just on the dollar amount, but that's completely true. You do want to look at at the other benefits that come with it as well. All right, great. So um, thank you, Margaret. Um, so this last or second last section, I guess, is going to touch on some management strategies and how that can impact your overall nutrition. So similar to Betsy's section, I apologize if some of this seems really basic. Um, I just think it's a really good reminder for both producers and nutritionists that um, management strategies and communication can really have a positive impact on how your nutrition does. So the first point that I want to make is that your nutritionist can only take the herd so far. And as I just mentioned, there are many, many different management strategies that have to be done on the producer end in order to see the results that you want to see. So I'm sure you guys have heard some variation of the following quote. There are four diets on the farm, one that the nutritionist formulates, the one that is mixed, the one that is delivered, and the one that the cows actually eat. So for this example, or for this slide, I wanna share one example from the summer that I spent with Scott Thorne Nutrition. So during that time, one of my summer projects was to complete a performance analysis for clients. And this incorporated all types of data from milk prices and butter fat and cow numbers 
to the nitty gritties of exactly how much of each ingredient that they were feeding. So when I was going through those, um, one of the questions that I would ask is, what are you feeding and what are your feeding amounts? And not all, but some would reply with whatever you sent me or whatever was formulated. And I learned pretty quickly that that's just something that they told me because that's what they thought I wanted to hear. And so I got in the habit of challenging them by asking, no, tell me what you're really feeding. And then in a lot of cases, um, they would, you know, spill the beans that their ration was deviating in some form or another. And sometimes those deviations were pretty large. So I'm not implying that you have to, you know, mix your diet to a T and get everything down to the exact pound. I know that's not practical. I just want to point out that deviations are worth paying attention to and that it's worth asking yourself the following question of why are you deviating? So it's kind of hard to quantify how much is a lot in terms of deviation. I think that depends on your farm, your goals, your abilities to mix to whatever accuracy you're mixing at. So that's kind of hard to quantify. However, whatever it is on your farm, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10%. If you're deviating from your fat sheet more than that, ask yourself the following question of why are you deviating? Are you out of a particular feed? Did you notice a change in dry matter? Maybe you switched bunks. Maybe you switched from second cutting to third cutting. Are cows not responding well? Maybe they're down in milk production. Maybe they're down in butter fat. Maybe you're just unhappy with the product and you completely took it out of the diet or didn't want to renew a contract. Or more commonly, this occurs, you're off in cow numbers and that just wasn't something that was um, factored in. So, the next point, I think it's important to think about, have you communicated those thoughts with your nutritionist? So the following lists are some items that should be communicated with your nutritionist on a regular basis. And again, um, I think this is pretty basic and I apologize if this is a review for a lot of you, but um, these are just things that sometimes get overlooked. So one of them being mixing issues. I was actually just talking to one of my good friends who's doing her PhD out in British Columbia. A few weeks ago, she sent me a picture of the diet and the chop length was just so long. And she's like, look at this diet, isn't this crazy? And I was just talking to her yesterday and it turned out that some of the knives in the mixer weren't working and the nutritionist had no idea. So there were some issues with sorting, some issues with acidosis and, um, you know, it's just something that you should be communicating with your nutritionist. It's really important information for them to know. Um, maybe you're having issues with grain flow and feed sticking to the side of the tank. Maybe you're seeing some odd cow behavior. So if they're licking each other's urine or excessively licking a salt block. If you notice a big change in refusal rates. So if you're typically going for 0% refusals and all of a sudden you have 5% or vice versa, if you aim for 5% and all of a sudden you have 0%, that's again, something worth communicating. Um, if you're noticing any excessive sorting or eating at one end of the bunk, if cow numbers change and pen number changes, again, the nutritionist is going to need to reformulate. If you notice any changes in manure, and then of course, metabolic issues. So if all of a sudden you have a ton of milk fever issues, that's again, a very important thing to be communicating with your nutritionist. All right, so um, Betsy, this leads us to our last poll question. So how much does your ration deviate from your fat sheet? So, I'm hoping for some honest answers here. Everyone's anonymous. You can tell the truth. I know that there's gotta be some out there that are deviating. All right, so we'll leave it up for a few more seconds and see if we get any more responses. All right, so it looks like the majority of people deviate a little bit, maybe on one or two ingredients, but for the most part, they follow the bat sheet, which is great. Uh, two people follow the bat sheet perfectly, that's awesome. And then two people adjust, well, one person adjusts for most of the ingredients and one hasn't seen a batch sheet in months. 
So a little bit of room for improvement, but for the most part, it looks like people are doing pretty good in terms of mixing. All right. Okay, so the final section that we're going to touch on is the relationship that the farm has with their nutritionist and vice versa for the nutritionist and how to improve communication. All right, so this is an example that I wanted to share. So um, this is a scenario that I walked into whenever I was working that summer for the nutrition company. So I'm going to lay out the uh, situation. So I walked onto the farm around 11 o'clock in the morning. They fed the cows at six o'clock in the morning and they don't feed again until six o'clock in the evening. So uh, someone, anyone, if you could put in the chat box, what, what do you think the problem is here? And I'll give you a hint. This is not a robot barn and cows are not away from milking. So they have free access to the feed whenever they want. It is a robot barn, right, Casey? Yes, sorry. It is a robot barn, but cows, so cows are not away um, in the parlor for milking or something. And I can't get the video to play. So just from the picture, what do you see? Anyone have any input? Or maybe you guys think it looks normal, which is also worth discussing. So the first thing that I noticed when I walked into that barn that day was that there were no cows up eating. And um, another thing worth noticing is that for not being fed for another seven hours, it doesn't look like there's a lot of feed to get them through. So, um, you know, maybe there's an issue with the feeding amount. So the point I wanted to make on this slide is that um, it may not be as simple as what it looks like when you first walk onto the farm. So to me, it looked like there were no cows eating, but why were there no cows eating? So when we digged a little bit deeper into the situation, we learned that the feed was heating and the cows weren't eating and you know it, they didn't like the way that it tasted and it was spoiling in the feed bunk. And the farmer had noticed that, but didn't think much of it, didn't think to tell us. and um, didn't want to put any more feed down because the cows weren't eating it anyways and they didn't want to waste it. So all around some pretty big issues um, in this situation and I think a lot of that could have been solved with a little bit of communication and not only that but just working together as a team to come down to the solution to the problem and try to come up with uh, a way to fix it. Okay, so just going into some tips for success. So I think it's really important to create a solution together. I recognize and appreciate that it can be very frustrating to suggest or ask for a change, whether you're the nutritionist asking the farmer to make a change, or you're the producer asking your nutritionist to make a change. If it's been days, weeks, months, you know, that have gone by and you notice that you're in the same boat, nothing's changed, things aren't getting done, of course, that's going to be frustrating. So I think it's really important that you think about why nothing's being done. Maybe you're not being heard. Maybe your worries and your concerns aren't being communicated effectively. So I think that when you have these conversations with your nutritionist or nutritionist, when you have these conversations with your producers, it's really important that you make sure that the suggested changes are achievable, achievable and practical for both parties. So you're not asking for or suggesting something that's completely out of reach and you know I know this is like a very basic example but you're not going to decide that you want to run a marathon and do it the next day right so making sure that whatever goals and changes you are presenting that it's achievable and practical and um, secondly I think it's really important to track progress and evaluate results so if you do make a change don't just throw your hands up and walk away and say you know, this is what it is, I encourage, encourage you to try to track your progress and evaluate the results. So document certain things, you know, document the day that you make a change, document how milk production may have increased or decreased for that matter, and just evaluate it over time and monitor how the cows are doing. And lastly, define expectations for both parties. So I think this is really important that at the end of a conversation, both parties are aware of what's expected of them. And I think that can really help um, both parties come to results that they're happy with and hopefully will minimize any frustration that's experienced in those difficult conversations. 
So the last point I want to make on this slide is that your nutritionist values your opinion and your perspective. After all, you're the one that's around the cows every day. So I recently watched a video that Daniel Scottborn posted on LinkedIn, and maybe you guys have seen it. I think it was uh, back in February or March, but it really stuck with me. And one of the points that he made was that when he shows up on a farm and a farm has a problem and asks him, you know, for a solution or asks him to fix it, when he says, or he'll reply to the farmer, well, what do you think the problem is? And in his video, he said that in some cases, the farmer would be like, well, no, that's why I pay you, you tell me. But I think it's really important that nutritionists value your client's um, opinion and perspective. And then producers, I think it's really important that you think about what is happening with your cows because you're the one that's around them every day. And the nutritionist isn't going to see you know, all the ins and, ins and outs of feeding behavior. They're not gonna see day-to-day -day changes. So I think it's really important that you have those conversations together and each of you have your opinions and perspectives heard. Um, so on that note, it's really important for farmers to, well, not only know these numbers, but also to keep your nutritionist aware of milk production and components. So fat, protein, milk, urea, nitrogen, and then any ab abrupt changes to those numbers. And then also changes in the feed. So whether that be a change in dry matter, maybe it's a new bunk, maybe you, you switch to a new cutting, maybe you have a new load of purchase feed, whatever it may be, make sure that those are communicated with your nutritionist. And the last point I wanna make goes back to one of the first points I made is that your nutritionist can only take the herd so far. And there's a lot that you can do to invest in your own part of your herd's nutrition. And understanding that and recognizing that is really going to increase the success that um, you have with your herd. So on this next slide, I just wanted to share with you an example of what I did that summer that I worked with Scott Thorne Nutrition. So this was one way that we kept up to date with our clients' components. Um, so this is an Excel sheet. I mean, you don't have to do something like this, but it, it worked really well for me. So I had the farm name on the left-hand side, and then I put in the weekly um, test results for butter, fat, and protein. So you can see um, we have protein and then fat, and then you can see the red cells that are highlighted there. So I put a conditional formatting on that whole Excel sheet so that if the individual um, result came or deviated more than 5% from the herd average, then it would be highlighted in red. And then in that case, we could go and follow up with the herd, ask if anything's going on, use it as a reminder to communicate changes. And more often than not, it was nothing. It was just day-to-day -day variation, you know, whatever, whatever it may have been didn't end up needing any significant attention. But then there were some situations where it did end up with us making a change or going up to the farm and having a visit and having a conversation. So again, just an example of something that you can do as a nutritionist and then also you can do as a producer, you could have your own running list of this and then if something comes up, you know, that could be a good indication that you should reach out to your nutritionist. Um, so, good on that slide, Margaret, thank you. So just to wrap it up, um, so as Bet Betsy went over the diet summaries, it can be very overwhelming, but just remember that you don't need to understand every number on that diet to know the important things about it. Um, based on Margaret's points, additives in the diet can be important, but it's very important that you have a clear picture of what is in the diet, why it's in the diet, and the return uh, on investment that it has. And then lastly, nutrition and the diet can only take a herd so far. As I mentioned, there's lots of management strategies that need to be considered. And communication is the cornerstone of every relationship. So making sure that you're on the same page as your nutritionist and your nutritionist, you're on the same page with your producers is going to maximize the success of that relationship and of the herd. So with that, we will take any questions. Thank you for your time.
Yeah, while we're waiting for questions to come in on the chat box, and I see there is one already, um, I just want to remind people and let them know um, at the end of this webinar, when you close out of the screen, there is a brief uh, survey that will pop up. It's only four questions long. We do appreciate um, your feedback that you give because this is all new for all of us in this new virtual world. So we appreciate any feedback um, and suggestions for future webinars. Um, we also have an online feeder school coming up in November. Uh, November 3rd and 5th is in English, and then on November 10th and 12th is a session in Spanish. And so you can find more information on that online feeder school at Cornell Pro Dairy's Regional Programs website, um, or reach out to any one of us and we can get you the link uh, for that. I believe um, we can put that into the chat box at some point as well. Um, and uh, also check out our podcasts. We have one dialing into your best dairy that's on the Cornell Pro Dairy website. And we're also working on another one that should be released at the end of November. So look for that in the e-leader as well. All right, switching over to our questions. So the first one that came in, um, Casey, is there any good way to measure feed sorting at a pen level without a shaker box? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Felipe. So ideally, a shaker box is a really good tool to have on farm. If you do not have a shaker box, you can look for um, like muzzle holes in the feed. Um, I can send you a video. And, you know, just walking up and down the feed bunk, you can kind of see if cows are using their muzzle to dig holes in the feed. That's a good indication of sorting. Um, walking through the pen and looking at manure is a good indication of sorting. So. If you see a lot of variation within a pen of cows that are receiving the same diet, so maybe you have some really stiff manure, maybe you have some really, really runny manure, that can indicate sorting. Um, and then if you're real eager, you could show up one day when feed is first delivered and show up the next day when feed is just before the feed refusals are taken away and look at any differences in the feed and just you know visually assess it. Yeah, Casey, you and I have talked as well about um, feeding behavior and sorting behavior as a learned behavior too. There's a lot of fun research out there about that as well, starting yeah. in our um, Next question, do you have any recommendations about grouping strategy? Margaret, do you wanna answer that? Um, if you don't, I can. can start and then you can add some stuff on if you want to. <laughs> um, grouping strategy is just as various as, um, as, as farms have ideas about how they want to feed or group their animals. Um, if there's a more specific question you could you can put it in the chat box otherwise I would say there's a there's a lot of um, people who group based on how many diets they would like to feed and there's a group of producers that group based on um, management of the different stages of lactation and how easy it is to maybe breed cows or they might wanna only lock cows up in one breeding pen or in specific breeding pens. Um, also, first calf heifers and mature cows have slightly different uh, nutrient requirements but also different social behavior and a lot of times those are, are grouped separately or there's a diet specific um, changes might be made to accommodate both types of animals in that way. Um, so really grouping is a really broad topic and there could be a lot of discussion and tons of different webinars and resources on that. Um, definitely something to talk with your nutritionist about too at, um, to see what the different options are on your farm. Betsy, any other thoughts? Yeah, I just want to reiterate that um, what you said about socially grouping uh, by parity. More and more I see farms going with this strategy and being very happy with the results, especially with their first calf heifers. Uh, the more we can group them separately um, through pre-fresh, through fresh period, and, and through that first lactation, the better off they do. So just echoing that. Uh, next question. 
what, in your opinion, is the optimal dry matter percent of the ration? Um, and I'll answer this one. So this, this might be a little bit different for every farm. Um, some of this can do with sorting behavior as well. The wetter we make this diet, the better we may uh, better results we may have for sorting because everything just sticks together better. Um, some farms can get away with a little bit drier ration and that does fine. Um, but I, somewhere around that 48 to 50 is about where I want to be. If, if we do get uh, sorting behavior, I'm going to go a little bit wetter. But I do that in caution, knowing that um, when we add water or we have improper conditions for heating, um, we want to make sure we monitor when we're adding water or whey that we're not going to get heating and some some things we aren't desiring. So that, that's the answer. Go ahead, Casey. <laughs> I was just going to add to that. So that's that's great for the lactating ration. I just wanted to add to that um, some work that I actually did in my master's research, looking at the dry matter content of the dry cow ration, and you know it's more and more popular that people are feeding those. Um, controlled energy dry cow diets that have a higher proportion of dry hay or dry straw as opposed to ensiled forages. And in my research, we found that adding water to decrease the um, dry matter to about 45%, which as Bessie said, is more, you know, similar to what the lactating ration should be. It actually improved intake, improved sorting, and even improved metabolic health after calving. So, um, that's always an option when you're feeding more of those dry forages, and especially in those diets for dry cows, adding water can definitely be beneficial. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. And last question we have up there. Margaret, for how long should we wait to measure if a rumen buffering additive works? I'd have to go back and, and look if there's any specific research on that, but just with any any diet change, you want to give it at least, I would say at least a week to to look at it. Mo many of the other additives take much longer to see over time, and um, but a rumen buffer, if you're having some acidosis issues and you provide either more bicarb in the diet or free choice bicarb, you might start to see within a few days those cows um, will have better looking manure. Um, more consistency throughout the pen, and um, hopefully, I'm, well, it, butter fat takes a while to to bounce back usually after those conditions. So that's not necessarily how I would measure um, improvements for bicarb um, over time. Yeah, hopefully you'd see that bounce back, but um, that's not the first place I would look. Betsy, anything else? Um, no. I I guess the, the thing that I like to tell farmers is that, you know, we're feeding rumen bugs and so we can kill them really fast <laughs> by doing things wrong, making a bad mix, putting in spoiled feed. Um, you know, we can throw off the rumen really fast and the changes to the rumen to bring it back take a lot longer, just like you said. So we can kill things fast, but at the end, if we have to regrow a population, it takes time to grow and to repopulate. So some of the changes take longer than we want, and so we have to wait a little bit longer. So. But monitoring cow behavior, like you say, I think is key. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, we look for your responses in the survey at the end, and we hope that we will see you on a future webinar. Thanks again.